God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's a spirit. He's giving you a spirit. When God made Adam, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the spirit. Man became a living soul. Man lives forever, either in eternity, in hell, or eternity in God's kingdom. And so God is a spirit, so the physical doesn't harm them. And, and that's what that's what really the book of Hebrews is all about, is getting Israel to the point of having faith in God, even if it means physical death, because they recognize that the promises are not in this life. They're in the life to come, and that their spirit and their souls never die. And so... Um, if you are subject to your father of your flesh, who at most is your father for 80 years, how much more should you be subject to the father of spirits, who will be your father for all eternity? And since he is a spirit, then he is only concerned about the spiritual, which means now, God certainly doesn't want them to be killed. He's, he's not a bad God and saying, yeah, I can't wait for my son to be killed by the Antichrist. He doesn't want that to happen. But he recognizes that what he wants is for all of Israel to be in the kingdom with him for all eternity. And if it means that they have to go through physical death in order to do it, he's willing to give them that chastisement of physical death. Because he says, hey, as long as their spirit's in the kingdom, physical death is no big deal. For God, because he's conquered death, hell, and the grave. So if he can just get their spirit to be alive, to have faith in the gospel, then physical death, when the time comes, he'll just raise them from the dead, give them physical life again, but their spirit will be alive with him in the kingdom. Verse 10 now, Hebrews 12, 10. For they verily, the fathers of our flesh, they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now when it says they for their own pleasure, it doesn't mean that your fathers are a bunch of masochists and they say, yeah, I can't wait till I spank my child does something wrong so I can spank him. It doesn't mean they took pleasure in doing it. Uh, usually parents love their children so much that they can even go to physical tears themselves and cry more than the child because they hate to see their child being physically hurt. Uh, for their own pleasure means that they do it for the good of the child, is really. They, they see the long-term result, and they'll say, you know, you hear the saying, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Yes, that's true, but the pleasure they get out of it is if I correct my child by spanking him, then I recognize that over the long term, I'm going to have a child who grows up to be an adult who respects authority, doesn't get in trouble with the law, lives a good, honorable, moral life. And so I'm willing to go through the tears of that as a father if it results in that long-term pleasure of seeing my son live a good life on this earth. That's, that's the pleasure part of it. But you notice it says, but he, meaning... God the Father, He does it. He does the chastening for our profit. Um, and the reason it says profit for that is because, I wrote on your outline, there is no profit to be had in this world because it will pass away. Look over in Mark chapter 8. And that's why Jesus says it's okay if the Antichrist physically kills you. He says in verse 36, Mark 8, 36, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So when he says, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What it means is if you get everything you can have in this world, you own all the money, you own all the land, you own all the animals, you own everything that's in this world. You gain the entire world. It says there is no profit in that. 
it does not profit you because you end up losing your own soul. And the reason is because the things of this world will pass away. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 35. <coughs> Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So, if I gain the entire world, I own all the precious metals, I own all the money, I own all the land, I own all the animals, I own, I own all the people. They're all slaves to me. I own every single thing on this earth. And then the earth passes away, then I own absolutely nothing. Because it's all gone. You know, what good would it do if I held a trillion dollars in my hand right here, and yet somebody came over here and snatched it away, and I never could get it back. That trillion dollars held no profit for me, even though I'm the richest man in the world. When it's taken away, I own nothing. And that's the idea here. Why would you align yourself with the Antichrist? Sure, they'll give you riches. They'll give you things of this world. But if all the world passes away, then there is no profit to anything you would gain in this world. And so going back to Hebrews 12 now, verse 10, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit. In other words, there is no eternal, lasting profit in gaining the things of this world. But there is for the child of God. And we read last time about how in Matthew 19, he says, those who have forsaken father, mother, sister, brother, houses, lands, for my sake, will receive everlasting life, and they'll receive an hundredfold in the kingdom. Well, there's your profit. Sure, I gave up my trillion dollars. Somebody took it away because I wouldn't take the mark of the beast. So now I'm the, I go from being the richest man on earth to being the poorest man on earth. But when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he gives me a hundredfold. Well, now i got a hundred trillion dollars. I've got a lot more than I had in the beginning. I've got profit. But if I, it's taken away from, if, if I don't have any, or if, if I own the whole world, and then the Lord Jesus Christ comes back instead of bringing me into the kingdom because I'm in unbelief, He sends fire down, wipes me out, and He throws me into a furnace of fire, I have no profit. So, verse 10 there, For, thus, for they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. In other words, we get into the kingdom. Verse 11, now, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I wrote on your outline that chastening builds spiritual muscle so that Israel can become adult sons of God. Um, just like those children are chasing. Look over in Revelation 1. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He says there in the tribulation period, they are servants. Israel is servants. Now look in Galatians 4. Galatians 4. For us today, in the dispensation of grace. Galatians 4. Verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. So if I am a child and I'm the heir, I'm just like a servant. What does God call Israel? He says they are servants. Uh, but verse 2, But as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. We were children, but now we're not. Verse 5, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So he says, at first we're an heir, 
because God recognizes us as, as going to be members of the body of Christ. But before we have faith, we as an heir are children. We haven't come into the full, uh, we haven't had faith, so we're not mature. We're still like children, and so we're still under tutors and governors. But then, when we trust in the blood of Christ as atonement for our sins, then we receive the adoption of sons, and now we are sons, we are no more servants. Now for Israel, we just read in Revelation 1.1 that at the beginning of the tribulation period, they are considered servants. Now let's go over to the end of Revelation and see what God calls them. Uh, Revelation... Uh, I think we're going to go to 21. Yeah. Revelation 21, verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So Israel is going to go from servant to son, just like we have, which means they're going to be heirs of all things. They're going to inherit the kingdom. But it's future. It says, I will be his God. He shall be my son. It's future for them. It's not for us. So now, when we go back to Hebrews 12, verse 11, when it says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Now you can see that analogy of the father spanking the son to get him to behave. They're considered servants or they're considered children. And then when the chastening period of the tribulation period is over, then they're considered overcomers. And God says, now you receive the adoption of full-grown sons. Now you inherit all things. You receive the inheritance. So the chastening happens during the tribulation period, and it's grievous. But then nevertheless, afterward, after the tribulation period is over, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now there is peace between God and Israel. He's no longer spanking them with physical death or eye plucked out or any trials they go through, they don't have to go through that. There's peace between God and His Son because now they've endured the chastening, they've obeyed Him, they've had the faith, and now they receive His righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And that's why I said chastening builds spiritual muscle because the chastening is, it's called, they are exercised by the chastening. And you think of the way you build up physical muscle is you do some exercises. You lift some weights, the muscle gets bigger. And spiritually speaking, the chastening of the Lord of Israel is an exercise. It's a spiritual exercise, and it builds up their spiritual muscle. So now they're not little kids that can't lift a small weight, but they're big, big muscles. They can lift the big weight, spiritually speaking. That's what it's talking about. So... Um, the last part in your outline we already covered. So we're through the chastening there. Uh, we're out of time. So next time we'll pick up in Hebrews 12, 12. Let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for being in the body of Christ and already being adult sons. Uh, help us also recognize that chastening of the Lord that you have for us through others, that we may believe your word and allow it to work through us, allow the Holy Spirit to teach it to us, so that when we are living out there among unbelievers or among Christianity, that they may see your word at work in us, that they may believe the gospel, that they may come into the knowledge of the truth, rather than us having to be judged by them as being just like everybody else. May Christ's love be seen through us as we believe your word. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for joining us. Next time we'll pick up in Hebrews 12, verse 12.